Well, everyone, today is February 5th, 2015. It's Thursday, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, uh, I think we've got enough to cover to warrant getting jacked up on some Mountain Dew. The makers of Mountain Dew did not compensate me for this endorsement. The Pepsco, if you're out there, please give me a shout out. Red Bull soda is too fat. <laughs> I am too fat. Working on that though. We do have a sponsor again this week, Financial Juice, which I've been doing some things with these guys lately. I've been enjoying it. Um, check them out at www.financialjuice.com slash Dave Landry. There's a lot of news there. As you know, I'm not a big news guy, but there's also, as the, uh, the owner, Amar, explained to me, it's financial um, social media. Kind of like financial Facebook. So um, you could follow several people there, and it'll pop up on the feed, which is pretty cool. And I think they're really on to something, and, and um, I'm very excited to be involved with them. I'll be having an ongoing show there uh, really soon. And I've, been, I've already been on their uh, webcast a couple times. Really, uh, I really hit it off with those guys really good. Anyway, good guys over there, so check it out. If you get a chance, um, use the link here. And then that will allow you to follow uh, my stuff there. And you could also, you could still follow anyone else once you get there. You're not locked into that. Anyway, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. I like to sum it up in saying all predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I stole that line from Greg Morris. Do me a favor. You read my book. You like my book. Put me a review up on Amazon.com. And the only reason I asked, well, it's two reasons I asked for that. Not the only reason, but two reasons I asked for that is one, um, obviously, for obvious purposes, for ego purposes, and um, if you like the book and you're willing to email me and tell me about it and ask me questions on it, then by all means, put me up a review. And number two is uh, every now and then you get a malignant person that reviews the reviews, which I can't imagine being that uh, malignant. If you've been covering these shows for a little while, you know that sometimes they get a little long-winded. Sometimes we don't really get everything covered, and the following week or so, I like to to give it back to you a little bit, put it back in your hands a little bit, get your questions answered, make sure we get to all the stock picks, et cetera. So I think this is going to be one of those weeks. Um, I do want to follow up on the setting of stops, and I've got a few examples here of some relevant um, positions and potential positions, or one position and potential positions, that I think um, will help to explain that a little bit further. So I do want to delve into that and obviously answer any of your questions on that. Um, hold off on your questions on individual stocks until we get to the the actual charts so we could um, uh, so they don't get bury the uh, questions about trading in general. But if you do have any questions um, or anything we're talking about today, feel free to ask. And if there's some other things you want to would like me to touch upon, feel free to ask those too. And as time allows, we'll get to those. And if not, it'll become fodder for next week's show. Okay. Um, last week, I, I said a couple things about setting stops, and I'm not sure if I had number three in there or not, but it's there now, and that's what I want to talk mostly about this week. But I want to rehash just a little bit. The first two questions you have to ask yourself or how long do you want to be in the position and how volatile is the underlying instrument. Now, my question, my answer, I, I guess, to number one is I want to be in a position 10 years or maybe even 20 years from now. So that volatility is going to be pretty extreme based on that because a stock can move a long, a long, a long ways, he tried to say, in 10 to 20 years. Well, the reality is I can't go in and, and put a stop that wide, okay, otherwise it would probably be at zero on every stock, so it wouldn't be a stop. But what I can do is simply say, well, you know what, I want to be able to survive the short-term volatility of this stock, and guess what? If things work out, I'm going to stick around longer term, hopefully for that 10 to 15 to 20 years in the stock. Now, 
that doesn't happen. But every now and then we're able to, to stick with the stock for two to three years. And usually those turn into tremendous winners over that period of time. So that's a good thing to do. The other thing is ask yourself, how volatile is the underlying instrument? Okay. And you have to factor in over that time period. And keep in mind that volatility waxes and wanes, and it changes quite a bit. But how volatile is the time, is the instrument over the time frame you're looking to trade? And I trade over the swing to intermediate time frame, and the, the bottom line is if I can survive the short-term volatility, the position might just have the potential to turn into a longer-term winner. So my stop has to be outside of that shorter term volatility and that's something that we spent a lot of time talking about last week. What I want to ha rehash upon a little bit more this week or flesh out a little bit more that I talked about last week is where would I obviously be wrong and you have to ask yourself that in a position. My mic just unplugged for a second hopefully it's still good. Um, and that's very important. Okay. Now, so again, where would I obviously be wrong? Now, let's take a look at once again the longer you go out in time the more a market could move, okay? So to stop distance goes higher and higher and higher. So a market can move a little bit over a short period of time and quite a long ways over a long period of time. So we really can't have a stop that can accommodate this going into a position. Otherwise, we'd have to have it weighed out here somewhere. But we can have a stop somewhere here outside of this normal volatility and then hopefully be able to ride out a substantial longer term move by, as I've said quite a bit, by slowly allowing that stop to widen out. Be glad if you could address an issue on handling 1.2 spread on a $14 stock would also be considered the bid as a stop or the last tick. Well, you could put in a contingency order in a case like that. Now that's going to open up a can of worms because each broker has its own contingency orders. So you could say, okay, the stop has to be hit, but it also has to be asking below the stop and it also has to have some volume. So there are ways to do that um, if you're not sitting there watching the screen. Uh, you could put an alarm in um, to warn you of that and keep an eye on it and watch the order flow a little bit. I'm not saying watch the market all day long, but you can certainly put an alarm, have an alarm go off when the stop is near being hit. I like to say near being hit so you're already ready. By the time it, it gets hit, you're already logged in and checking out things. Um, I would avoid, you know, if you can't watch that, I don't say watch a screen all day. I'm saying get an alarm on your smartphone and then deal with it for a few minutes. I mean, it, it, you don't have to watch it all day long. And if the stock goes back up, then you um, go back to uh, your life. But anyways, the bigger, the more time, obviously, the bigger the stop, okay, is going to have to be. Same holds true for volatility, okay? And if you combine volatility with time, those two are going to make that stop increase uh, significantly. And that might even be a little bit more of a geometric rise because of the, based on the volatility of the stock. Now, the best way to judge volatility, which we'll talk about here in just one second, is to eyeball it. Um, the, the, what I like to, to plot on every chart, at least just a number of it, I don't really care about the actual graph, but on every chart, I plot the historical volatility reading. So I know how volatile that stock is, and it's a relative thing. If the market at S&P 500 is 13, I think last time I checked, that's about where it was. 
might be a little bit more, but not much. And the stock is 150. Well, I know that that stock is more than 10 times more volatile than the overall market, and that stock's going to be pretty crazy, require a pretty wide stop, and I need to think whether or not it's worth trading. Usually once you get into those triple digits, except lately it seems like these little gold stocks have, have tremendously high historical volatility, and they also have some structure to them. But for the most part, once you get into that triple-digit historical volatility, your structure of the market is not going to be there because the market is just kind of bouncing around. Okay, now this is what I want to talk about mostly this week is where would that position be a failure? Well, this is somebody's first week of chart, and they're like, oh, stop, this guy's so boring. <laughs> well, last week I talked about my pink thong, so maybe watch last week's uh, presentation. Anyway, so where would, this, where would the position obviously be a failure? By the way, it's like I haven't done a whole lot of Googling or YouTubing, but I'm probably one of the first guys out there, one of the only guys out there, that spends certainly as much time as I do talking about money management. And as I've said time and time before, and I'm going to say it again today, so for those of you who know me, my apologies, because I do tend to reiterate things over and over again. I'm guilty of retelling stories. Anyway, long story endless, I know too late. If I'm speaking somewhere, usually after the presentation, the stage gets rushed, and... Few people want to know about, or most people want to know about this setup or that setup, or what do I think about this market, and, and all these questions, mostly about setups. And one out of ten people, if any, will ask me a money management question. And if I had to bet on who was going to make it as a trader, I would say it would be the person who's asking me about money management. Because they're not so worried about chasing that holy grail, and they're a little bit more worried about protecting their existing capital. Biggest problem with setting stops is that they don't work when a large overnight gap happens. Well, okay, two things, three things on that. First of all, in general, surprises usually happen in a direction of the trend. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, go to watch last week's presentation. I'll show you real quick here. If we pull up, um, oops, we lost the, uh, lost my feed. Let's pull up um, a recent example from my trading service in the RO. Okay, so Fred's worried about overnight gaps. Well, guess what? Sooner or later, you're going to get whacked. That I can promise you. But as a general statement, and I learned this from Jeff Cooper many years ago, surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend. So this was a nice positive surprise. Not all the time, okay? But as a general statement, that happens. And if they don't, sometimes, and read the second half of Laban's, Sometimes, if you could just take a deep breath and relax, and I know, haha, -ha, so you come in, market's down here, and the market gaps to down here overnight, okay? Well, let's say that's a 10-point loss, okay, something substantial. Well, guess what? You already have that loss, and giving it a little bit extra wiggle room ain't going to kill you, because a lot of times, you know, you've got to realize, you've got a little market maker out here. And he might be left holding the bag on this stock. And guess what? Everybody, their brother, wants to get out. So he's got dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of people saying, oh, Mr. Market Maker, please let me off the hook, okay? And he says, okay, um, how about I sell it to you 10 points lower? Okay, well, whatever you say, yeah, we'll just, we just want our money. We'll take as little money as possible. So he opens it way down here, 
and all these people rush out. And guess what he does? He accumulates all his stock. Well, he's kind of left holding the bag. All right, and what is in that bag, by the way? What does that mean, holding the bag? So what's he going to do? Well, he's stuck with all his stock. What if he can magically make that stock go up? Let's say he can make it go up two points to eight points. Total loss now. Okay, he can take that 10 minus eight, two points, and he could put it in his pocket. Okay, so he just took advantage of all of these people out here that came in freaking out. Okay, so he's trying to make money off of you because you had the dump on him, not necessarily you because you got a little discretion. Now, notice that I said you got to have an uncle point in mind. Sometimes it gaps lower and it keeps on gapping lower and it keeps on going. You have to get out. Well, if you had a 10-point loss coming in overnight, that's reality. So what if you lose another point or two? That ain't going to kill you. You're already dead coming in, okay? But a lot of times, that stock will reverse and then rally up. Sometimes it can even be profitable by the day, by the end of the day in the spirit of like a trend knockout because those people got knocked out. So if it does come all the way back, then you can stay with the position. And not all the time, okay? So I, the, the main thing is what? Sooner or later, you will get whacked. Let me just write it down here. Okay, that's one thing whacked. That's one thing I can guarantee. Trust me, it happens. Okay, that's spelled with a silent SH, okay? Sooner or later, you're going to get whacked. But if you longer term take a sensible approach to the markets and don't do stupid things, then you will be in that position that's going up 100% or 200%. And if you get whacked on one, it's going to suck, okay? But guess what? So what? We get paid to put capital in harm's way. If you want safety, buy some T-bills and don't trade, okay? But don't think that you could buy a market that's not volatile and still not get whacked, okay? I saw some REITs. I haven't been, hey, Dave, REITs have been going up. They've been setting up. And I've been getting a lot of emails from people. Hey, Dave, what about this REIT? Yeah, it looks good. It's got to pull back. Um, tell me where you think you should enter. Tell me where you want to stop. Where you think your stop should be. Tell me your whole plan, and I'll either agree or disagree. Well, Dave, how come you're not putting them on your service? Well, they're lower in volatility, and something bad could still happen. So I did a whole presentation about this. If y'all can't find it on YouTube, let me know, and I'll post it up there. No, no problem if I can find it myself. It's going to be on one of the flash drives. If you had the flash drives, it's out there. But I did a whole presentation on the fact that something bad could happen, even a lower volatility issue. So it's better the devil you know. It's better to trade a more volatile stock that's more likely to move in your favor. Of course, it might go against you. But at least you'll have fewer shares on. And if you go in and look at the REITs, there were a couple of REITs recently that got, autom that got torpedoed. So... You're not safe by trading a lower volatility stock. And, again, I don't want to digress too far. I spent a whole presentation on that, okay? Any suggestions on how to avoid the inevitable overnight gaps that can stop you out with the greater loss you anticipated things? Uh, well, first of all, if you're risking 2% on the position maximum, okay? And then sometimes, sometimes you'll get up here and you'll take off that 1% at the initial profit target. So now you only have 1% on when you get whacked. So sometimes that money management helps tremendously. Margin call. 
So that can help quite a bit. How many times I have to tell you? I do a webinar every Thursday. So that can help. Uh, the damage control can help tremendously. And that really puts you on the side of the market maker when you're doing that little damage control. This guy's got to eat too, okay? So, again, it happens, but sometimes you can negate and actually profit off of that situation. So, without, before I digress too far, I know too late, let's get back to the, what we were talking about. Let's say you have a first thrust position, okay? Now, this is going to make a lot more sense. This is, a, this is an enlargement of a chart we're going to look at in just one second. But for argument's sake, let's say you have this first thrust situation where a market begins to rally nicely off its lows. It has the little minimum of a one-bar pullback, okay? So you look to enter right around here. So where would you be wrong? Well, if it gives up most of that rally and comes back in after it triggers, you're probably wrong there. And if you could handle it, and you, all you have to do to handle it, by the way, is just trade fewer shares, you could put it a stop at the old lows. And if it triggers, it goes to old lows, then guess what? It's probably a continuation of the longer-term downtrend. Keep in mind that emerging trends are going to be more riskier to trade than established trends, but there with with risk comes reward. Again, we get paid to put that capital in the harm's way. So sometimes, not every day, sometimes not every week or every month, but every now and then, you'll catch that little solar stock. You'll catch a little IPO just beginning to take off. You catch a little solar stock that's bottomed out and then rallies for two years like SPWR, or you'll catch like BRY and the oils and, and all these other stocks back in 2009 when oils got decimated, and then they begin to bottom out and rally off their lows, okay? By the way, speaking of oils, in case you were wondering, this is, this is USO. This is oil, okay? Now, let's take another look at an example This is the gatekeeper and the dollar yen. I am currently short this uh, pair, full disclosure. I don't think I'm going to push the market around by announcing it in my weekend charts into YouTube, but just in case somebody says, hey, Dave, you were talking to your position. Yeah, I'm talking about position. I hope it goes to zero. No, I don't hope it goes to zero, but I hope it goes down. <laughs> okay, I know I just said hope. Uh, this started out as a gatekeeper. A gatekeeper, as you know, is a sharp retrace stalls at its prior highs. To the trade die, you'll also know there was a bit of a head and shoulders in the works, okay? So if anything, it kind of stalled out and began to roll over. Call it whatever you want. It later uh, manifest into, is that the right word, manifest, or turned into a bow tie. A bow tie developed. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for without being trying to be too eloquent. So you get a short sell here. It kind of bounced up a little bit, but then it's kind of, for the most part, it's begun to die out in here. Kind of a slow death. Kind of a Chinese water, water torture kind of death. But if this is your gatekeeper in here, and by the way, write this down. Go in and look at, like, I think it might be a weekly gatekeeper goal, going way back to the all-time highs. Go back and look at, um, I think it's a two-day or a three-day gatekeeper and bonds going back to the last time they made all-time highs and this also works with bow ties and first thrust and other of my emerging trend patterns many times you'll get this emerging trend pattern and not only is the high never taken out from these major 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 tops but the the high of the setup is never taken out in these major, major, major tops. Now, I don't know for a fact, but we might have the mother of all tops in this dollar yen, and I hope I can hold on to it. And I'm going to try. I'm going to try my best. Okay? But you can see so far we haven't taken out that the high of the setup. 
So once things begin to work for you in this particular case, maybe the higher the setup is a good place for that stop. But initially, if you put your stop at new highs, and look how close you are, you're not that far away. That's not that big of a deal. Then if it goes on to new highs, then what? Well, then this, the big blue arrow, in this case it's red, trumps the little, the little blue arrow, okay? And going back to the prior example, and again, this will probably make a lot more sense once we get to the uh, thing. Let's see if we get a, see if we get blue to work in here. Order options in color blue. Okay. So in this particular case, you got this going on, but this is oil. So as you know, with oil, and again, we'll get the chart in just one second. Longer term, it looks a lot like that. So sometimes you're a little early. Again, I always say you're late to the party as a trend follower. Well, sometimes you're a little early when you're trading these emerging trends, these trends coming off of these major lows, okay? But like the American pioneers, you either get the gold or the oil. Sometimes it's worth it, okay? As far as risk to reward, it's a huge reward to risk because if you capture that all-time top, okay, not that we're top picking, but if you capture that all-time top, at the first signs of it rolling over, especially something like a gatekeeper, which is a very aggressive type of pattern, or a pioneer first thrust, which is a very aggressive type of pattern, you have the potential to capture a major, major, major move in that market. That's going to be many times your initial risk. Gaps, mostly earning news. I use options to lock in price to capture price pre-gap, 3 to 5% cost. Okay. Well, there's a lot of moving parts with that, Phil, and Phil's a little bit more advanced, and I think I'll use some emails, Phil, so my apologies. I've just been swamped lately. Um, Phil's a little bit more advanced, and I, and I know Phil somewhat personally. We've talked a few times. He's over in the U.K. Um, there's a few moving parts with that, and the problem is leading into earnings – your historical volatility, I'm sorry, your implied volatility is going to get high, okay? So let me just do a screen on that real quick. I, I can't argue with that, but all I can say is let's, let's say a stock's trading along, and then on this day here, somewhere in time, it's going to be earnings announcement, okay? Well, there's a good chance that if you're looking at the implied volatility, what I call the fluff, of an option, the, the, for lack of a better word, well, I guess implied volatility is, is back of a letter, better word. That implied volatility is going to begin to skyrocket or go up before earnings. And as soon as the earnings are announced, what's going to happen? It's going to implode. Okay. So I hear you, but that can get expensive. And then you have to do that every three months. Okay. Let's say you got a tiger by the tail, you got a good long term position. Well, every three months you're doing that. Um, on the occasion that you do get whacked, yes, it's going to be fantastic. It's going to work out great. Um, but nine out of ten of the other times, I think you're better off just living through it. And if you have to, do your damage control. But don't let me stop you from going out there and studying options and pricing options, especially if you've got a really good. If you got a really good profit, if you're in a stock and you're, you're way up here and you got earnings right here, uh, price the options, see what they look like. Remember, though, hedging, as I often preach, more often than not, does not work, and it's very expensive. Okay, heading is a ma heading. hedging is a major expense. Okay. I used to think that, but I plan to exercise also go out three weeks and you have lower HP. Yeah, well, three weeks you have lower HP, but at some point you start, right around that three weeks, you hit the nonlinear decay. But I hear you. I was asking about the bid way below the last price, just hitting the stop price. Obviously, I can only sell at the bid, and, and the bid already is at my uncle point. I am in front of the market all the time. Uh, well, then you have to get out. Um, 
you know, that's the trade-off. You're trading a thinner issue. Um, some of these little IPOs that I, that I dearly love, every night it just sucks. Um, but if you are in front of a screen, set that alarm, even so you don't have to watch every tick and don't get sucked into it. And just just deal with it. And, and yeah, um, spreads can suck. Sometimes you could trade in between the spreads using a limit order, but then that, that opens up another can of worms too. But yeah, it sucks. It's just it comes with the territory. And the more inefficient that stock is, and that's something that I've talked a lot about, obviously. In fact, I spent a tremendous amount of time talking about that in the stock selection webinar. I also have two articles coming out on that. Well, one in German and one in English. The German article should be out any day in Traders Magazine. English should be uh, coming out soon. So, yeah, there's a trade-off with efficiency. Now, let's take a look at the USO. Okay. It's been in a longer-term downtrend, obviously, but what's happened lately, you can see it kind of stabilized a little bit in here. Nope, it went on to probe new lows. But this action, okay, let's take a look at this. This action here, and then now what happens? It's sort of beginning to kind of bottom out a little bit. Now, you don't rush out and buy it just because the descent has slowed. You wait for a signal. Well, we got a bit of a signal in here. Notice that it came rallying significantly off of lows. That's a pretty decent move because it's making multi-month highs, or at least one-month highs, and then you had this little knockout move here. So I think it's worth a stab right around here somewhere. Okay. But if it does trigger and then it comes back down, again, we know we are absolutely 1,000% wrong as it makes new lows. And then that's when I would say, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Okay. Now, you might decide that, well, I don't want to wait for it to get all the way back to those old lows because if it comes down here somewhere, then maybe we're kind of back into that soup, so to speak, where it just kind of is bottoming out. And maybe it's going to be more of a process than an event like gold. Like the energy stocks, for instance, have been bottoming out for a couple of months in here, but they haven't bottomed yet. That's why I'm using the jar in there, bottoming, okay, kind of sounds like bottom bing. Again, common sense is your best friend. A couple things we said last week and a couple things I want to add this week. You eyeball it, okay. Someone has told me before that I seem to have a gift for setting stops. I never thought about it like that, but... That gift comes with watching the markets and studying the markets and trading the markets and being involved with hedge funds and, and working hard on the institutional side and on the retail side for over 20 years. And, and as I often say, getting my ass handed to me a few times, uh, looking at a few thousand charts a day, okay? You do that for 20 years and you get a feel for it. Sometimes I forget not being vain because I put in my time, I'm just saying, sometimes I forget that that what comes naturally, so to speak, to me might not come naturally to somebody else. Well, it did come naturally to me is the point I'm trying to make. And I'm not trying to be vain. I'm just saying I've been at it a while, and if you're at it a while too, you'll begin to get it. So you will need some experience to, quote, unquote, eyeball it. It's been said an overnight success takes about... 10 years. If you read, um, not Blink, but I think Outliers by Mac Malcolm Gladwell, read them all. They're on my website. Um, but uh, read read anything by Malcolm Gladwell. That's I got his latest up on the website. I need to finish it. I've got, the problem is I start too many books at the same time. But anyway, I digress. But he pointed out that an overnight success takes about 10 years. And he's not the first person to point that out. There's a few other books that talk about that that subject, but I think talent is made and not born. Um, I think there's another book out there that talks very s similarly, which is great because I don't think I have any, I don't think I have any natural abilities to trade. I think that everything was developed and an overnight success. I think the, the, 
the the 10 year thing is is a pretty good uh standpoint pretty good thing and and, and Gladwell talks about 10,000 hours i could i could sharply reduce that learning curve for you if you just listen to me okay and trade something simple and don't go off and chase those rainbows and and try to do all this complex and arcane things and try to top pick the exact tops and exact bottoms and all that stuff but sometimes it just kind of dawned on sometimes it just dawns on me or I just kind of think that maybe maybe that's part of who you are that would make that's what makes you who you are and that's what it takes okay I hate to admit that but that's what happened with me I did a lot of souls not soul searching but a lot of um, holy grail hunting to get where I am anyway so eyeball it, and the eyeball is going to come with experience, but it's not rocket science, okay? Uh, as I preach over and over and over and over and over again, if a market is bouncing around three and four and five points away, well, if your stock is your stop is two points away, then guess what? You're going to get stopped out. That I can almost guarantee, okay? But don't overthink it, okay? You should be able to see that a market is moving around four and five points a day. Well, you know that your stop's going to have to be outside of that range. It's, it's, it's almost that simple, okay? There are a few things. Maybe if a market is extended to one direction, you might be able to get in a little tighter. Maybe if it's a, a gatekeeper or something, you might be able to get in a little tighter. Maybe it's a witch hat where you had a sharp retracement like we talked about last week, you might be able to get a little tighter. But for the most part, don't overthink it and just make sure you're outside of that normal volatility of that market. You could use whatever helps you to wrap your head around that. Okay, I like to use a little HV in addition to eyeballing it. Then I ask myself, where would it be wrong? Uh, some people like average true range. I was uh, experimenting with that before the show, and I really didn't have anything conclusive that I could give you. But I know a lot of people like that. A lot of people like something a little bit more quantified. The only problem with something a little bit more quantified is that you end up with a statistically based stock, and those could be quite large. If you looked at that parabola I drew laid on its side, which you can do a meta stock, and you can use it uses HV. It takes the HV backwards and projects it forwards, which is kind of fun to play with. But you can see really quickly that that parabola laid on its side gets pretty wide, pretty fast. Okay, so again, use your common sense when it comes to uh, setting stops, and don't overthink it too much. And again, sometimes the depth of the pullback, you know, if it's pulled back deeply. You don't necessarily need to add that much to this much because by the time you do, you're already back to the old lows. Okay. Whereas if it's a bit of a more shallow pullback, maybe you need to go a little bit more deeper than what's already pulled back. Because at least in this case, as I said a second ago, you might have the potential for a reversion to the mean trade. Now, you got to ask yourself, what is the least amount of room I can give this position and it will still work? And like Einstein said, make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. So in this particular case, set the stop as loose as possible, but no further. Okay? As I alluded to a minute ago, is the HV super high? Are you dealing with a stock with an HV greater, greater than 100? Okay? Then it's crazy volatile. And it better, you better make sure it's got some structure, or you better make sure you think it's good enough to trade in structure, of course, before going after it. Now, if you're getting stopped out a lot, as I've told the story a thousand times, I'll tell a thousand more. What's her name? She sings a song about a thousand times and a thousand more. Well, that could be, <laughs> that could be my stories, right? And I'm going to keep saying it. These stories until you people get it. But you want to err on the side of being a little too loose. As I said quite a bit, again, a thousand times. I've fixed a lot of people. Dave, I'm I'm having a lot of trouble. Well, give me a call. Let's talk. All right, phone rings. Talk to him. 
It's like, well, sounds like your stops are too loose. And they loosen up their stops and they start catching trends. Okay. Now, how does that work? Well, if you think about it, this is why mechanical people don't use stops. Okay. Because let's say a market does this and you've got like a pullback system. You're buying here. Okay. Let's just redraw that a little bit. Let's try that again. Let's just kind of walk through it. Okay, let's say you got a mechanical system and you're buying here. Okay. If you put in a stop here, okay, then you get stopped out and then what happens? The market takes off. So these people who run these mechanical systems say, oh, well, look, you stayed. If you if you run a system, you'd make 100%, at least on this one trade. Well, the reality is this thing was strongly against you, and you'd be kind of foolish to, to stick with it, okay? But on a somewhat less extreme point, if you've got a stop that's right here, you're almost guaranteeing your loss. And maybe if it's just a little bit further away, you might be able to ride out that normal volatility and then take, take off. So obviously, the wider you stop within reason, the more likely you are to capture a trend. And this is why your system people, a lot of them don't use stops because stops actually will hurt the system, which is fine and dandy, except when you get the black swan comes along and wipes you out. Now, I don't want to digress too far into that. I do. There are some mechanical people out there that I respect, okay? And, but they're, they're doing things in a little bit different way. They have contra signals. And there's, there's some things that they're doing to compensate for that, not using the stops. But I don't want to get into that. We'll maybe have them on one day and have them talk about that. Maybe one day I'll have some uh, guests on. That would be kind of fun. So I don't have to listen to myself talk so much. Um, the other thing, if you're getting stopped out, like I said, 19, 20 times in a row, you probably have too tight of stops and or, and this is a big or, your stock selection might need a little improvement, okay? So the point I was making last week is if you improve your stock selection, not only are you getting more winners, but you're getting fewer losers. And if you just move, avoid one loser from something that, soft sell coming, watch out, that you learn from the stock selection course, then you've paid for the course. And that's just one. You get one winner, then you pay for the course ten times. So my point is that your best defense is a good offense. Now, I just spent however many minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes talking about stops. But why not just get 40 minutes, get into the best stocks to begin with. And a lot of times the positions will take care of themselves. And you don't have to worry about that protective stop as much. You just trail your stop higher. And then the problem becomes a good problem to have, whether or not how much you want to let that stop loosen up so you can ride out that longer-term trend. So I can't emphasize this enough. So do spend a lot of time understanding volatility of the market. Do understand where the stops should be placed. But also spend a lot of time on learning how to pick the best stocks to begin with. Well, Dave, doesn't that contradict what you said about people setting stops uh, coming up to you after the webinar? No, because it, 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 it takes both, okay? You do need to know how to pick the best stops. What I'm talking about is people just a setup junkie, a method junkie, want to study all these different methods, study all these different uh, setups. You know, pick a few things that work for you, get good at it, and then on top of that, of course, learn the way to set the stops. But once you learn how to set your stops, focus your energies on picking the best to begin with. So a good offense is quite often your best defense. So pick the stocks to begin with. Now, as you know, here it comes. I have a stock selection course out there. So what I'm saying is learn how to pick the best stocks and then compare your picks to mine for one year free. So I'll give you a whole year of my trading service so you can see what I'm picking and compare it to what you're picking. And that's been a wonderful exercise for a lot of people, if I say so myself. There's a lot of people out there that have complimented me on that because they're able to, within three to four months, they're able to click in to what I'm doing 
by comparing their list daily to my list daily. And of course, within reason, I'll let you, you could email me questions and we could see why we pick certain stocks or not. Sometimes even agree to disagree, and that's fine too. That's what makes a market. But eventually they, they get in sync, sync with me, and I say, now wait a minute, don't leave me just because you got it figured out. Keep me on staff for when you don't care to do all that homework or you simply can't do it. And I built a lot of good relationships like that. So I, I, my point is, treat me like an institutional client treats me as part of their staff. So anyway, but uh, you will get a year free of the service with that, so check that out. And the link is right here, or you can go straight to the store, which I'll give you the link for that in one second. Okay. Now, once again, I didn't tell you exactly where to put the stop, but it is an art board of science. Okay. You will get stopped out here and there. When I speak um, in person, usually I'll say, anyone here ever get stopped out to the penny and then watch in anguish as the stock takes off. And depending on the level of the room, if it's a more advanced crowd, everybody in the room raises their hand, or most everybody, I should say. Because sooner or later, once again, it, spelled that silent SH, happens. So be willing to get stopped out on occasion. It comes with the territory. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. To rehash, you're getting stopped out a lot, loosen your stops. But maybe before you even think about loosening your stops, spend some time getting better at picking stocks. And oh, by the way, plot your indices. Like I wrote this morning in a column. Somebody quit the service recently. I'm looking for more action. I'm looking for more action. Well, there's not always action in the market. Sometimes you need to just sit back and wait. Even if you are a very active trader, a day trader, sometimes there's times when you shouldn't be doing anything, believe it or not. It's not always this constant action. We live in this microwave society, instant popcorn. I mean, video stores went out of business. I've said this before, I know, but because people can't, oh, it's too much. It would take too long to drive to a video store and drive back home. I need my video right now. I need everything right now. Okay, we've grown accustomed to that. I think Amazon's uh, in New uh, they're trying to do like two hour delivery in New York. You can't wait for your stuff to come in the mail. You know, it's like that's the society that that we have become. We want everything right away. I'm guilty as guilty as charge. Okay, I uh, I'd love to know how much I spent over the years overnighting things. Overnighting things that I really could have waited a week for, <laughs> you know. Oh, I gotta have that tomorrow. Okay. So we're that society. Unfortunately, the market doesn't always accommodate. There isn't always something to do. And then just to kind of dovetail into like what last week's dead money report. And when it does accommodate, it doesn't all always accommodate on our time frame. Sometimes you have to wait and be patient and let things develop, okay? Do you ever adjust the position size, say 1% in a questionable market to 3% if it's really booming? Also, okay, well, let's let's answer that first. The question is, you ever sometimes trade 1%, sometimes trades 3%? The quick answer is no, because you always have to be consistent. And if I'm trading 1%, Sometimes, and all of a sudden, we end up in these great markets. Then I got these little tiny positions, okay? But let's say we're in what appears to be great markets, and I'm trading 3%. Then conditions go sour. Now I got these big positions, okay? So I think you have to be consistent and trade around that 2% threshold. Much less than that if you do err to trading, new or new to trading. Now, if things are going really, really well, maybe I'll press a little bit. And maybe you could press a little bit. A little bit being the key word that said it. And again, I don't want to open up that can of option worms. But maybe you could take a little bit of money if things are going that great and fritter away some capital. Okay, just a little bit. And in 99 and 2000, one of the things that I was preaching was that the option market could not fully reflect what was happening in the underlying stock market. And so you could get a little leverage 
in long options back then because everything was just so crazy. And as I said before, what was it, Redneck Networks or whatever it is, Redback Networks or whatever, I put it in my column and it triggered and came, it like triggered and came right back in. And then by the end of the day, it went up 58 points. And this was like a, I forget what it was, 30-something dollar stock or something at the time. I don't even know if it still exists. So that's the kind of crazy market we were in, and then the options couldn't fully reflect that kind of market. So, yeah, if we ever get a 1999 again, then maybe you could press a little and maybe put on some, some wild and crazy option trades. But as a general statement, you need to be consistent. Yeah, press a little bit if things are going fantastic. But for the most part, you need to be consistent. So, well, what about back it off a little bit or back it off to 1%? Well, the best way to do that is is to back off to 0% and wait for the market to come to you. When that market's going sideways, let it base out a little bit. Let everybody else fight it out. Like Livermore said, and I quoted him earlier in my column today, and I quote him often, by the way. So that's your 0%. It's just backing off on the amount of trading. And then when things are doing good, you're still doing that 2%. But what you're doing is you take more and more trades because you see more and more opportunities. Okay? So, yeah, you're pressing a little bit then. And then you're going into margin just a little bit. Let's say you got five trades on. And you go to take the six, well, let's say you've already started taking profits on those, let's say two out of those five, and then the remaining three are pretty close to uh to the um profit target. You're almost out of more you're almost out of money, but you can go into margin, get on that six position, knowing that one of those prior five or however many it is, is gonna hit that profit target and you can be taking money off the table. So you can get a little bit of leverage then. You know, be careful with that. Leverage cuts both ways. I don't want to go out there and say, go get margined up because you'll call me up crying. Okay. But but you could push a little bit in those kind of conditions. Okay. Um, also, I'd be happy. I guess you'd be, I'd be happy. I'd be hooey. I guess you'd be happy. You must the fat figure of the yo. I'd be happy to be a guest and talk about how long, how to go long at the top of a market and how to go short at the bottom. Well, John, if you've been trading long enough, we all we all have gotten that little t shirt. We've also we've all been there, done that, and got that t shirt. Okay, it happens. Okay. And what I try to do longer term is I try to balance out, let's say let's say let's assume you're not top picking or bottom picking. Well let's assume that we trade some emerging trends along with the trend resumption, resumption patterns and along with the trend acceleration patterns. There's trend resumption, there's trend acceleration, and then there's emerging trends or trend transitions, as I sometimes call them. Let's say you do all three of those things. Well, hopefully you're getting enough. You're making some in the middle and you're making a little bit on the ends and sometimes a lot on the ends to where it all balances out. But, yeah, sooner or later you will end up buying at the top and selling at, and selling at the bottom. And it happens, okay? Do you have a scan add-on for Metastock? I have a um, – I don't have one officially, Henry, but email me on that. Um, the, the good people over there wanted to put my scans in Metastock last year. I never did get around to telling them, uh, please do, and, and, and I didn't know what was involved to get started. Many years ago, I wrote all my scans for Metastock. Um, so uh, I don't – but I no longer have those. They're no longer available, and I don't know what – they're probably on some computer here that's been in storage for 10 years. Uh, but the good people over there said they would do my scans. I prefer to do – I don't want to demarket myself. I'd love for them to sell them. Um, I prefer to do looser parameter scans, which I use in TC, Telechart, um, I use Metastock for some of these other things, more involved analysis to experiment with occasional uh, indicator or so, believe it or not. But for the most part, the indicator is usually not price-based. It's usually going to be like volatility-based or something that I'm working on. Uh, but I know some people like to scan for specific patterns. I have, I have a bit of a problem with that because no scan is perfect, but I understand where some people would like to do that and – uh, far be it for me to not accommodate, and I can see where you're going with that. And you know, truth be told, I actually, if I'm on a, um, 
I was on an institutional project a while back, and this gentleman was looking for certain patterns for his fund. So in addition to me doing my empirical research by looking at a lot of charts just to make sure I didn't miss anything, I was also running specific scans. So they do have that purpose. Okay. Okay. A couple announcements. Again, I have the store out there, as I've told quite a few times. The reason I have a store now is because I had somebody tell me, hey, Dave, really like your product, really like your stuff. I'm not sure why you hide everything on your website. So now I think most everything is, is right there in the store and easy to find. Okay. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on, on housekeeping, just one or two things. Um, the IPO course has unlimited lifetime support like everything I do. Now, unlimited is within reason, obviously, uh, and with the IPO course, it retains to IPOs. Uh, some people confuse unlimited support with, hey, Dave, I'm working on this trading system. It's like, well, no, that's not what support is all about. I already have a trading system. If you're interested in, in asking me questions about my trading system, please do. Okay. But if you're interested, if you have questions about an IPO that you see after taking the course, then by all means, please ask me on that. So as long as you're alive, <laughs> you can ask me. And again, one last thing. I'm not going to say much more here because I want to jump into the charts. But again, you get a year to service, which uh, retails for 1457 is free with the stock selection course. So um, the whole thing's about half priced total. All right, let's hop into the charts. And uh, you know what? Feel free. You can still ask me anything you want about um, anything we talked about so far. But if you'd like, uh, you can start asking me individual stock questions. So let me uh, get through the charts real quick, and then we'll start looking at some uh, individual charts. Uh, yeah, John, I like cake. He wants to know if I like cake. I love cake. Have you seen my girth? Oh, cake to stock. Oh, okay, we'll get to that in a minute. All right, let me get to... Um, let me get to the – let's take a look at the overall market, okay? And as you know, I like to look at the micro, and then work my way out. Now, last Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, okay. Last Friday, we're down here, and it looked like the market was going to come unglued. And – Digging within a lot of the sectors, it looked pretty darn ugly, okay? The banks were beginning to implode, a lot of areas that had recently hit new highs were coming back in. It was ugly right there, okay? Now, on Monday, what did I come in and say? Sell, 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 sell? No. We didn't take out the bottom of the range. Not that there's anything could be magical about that, but we didn't take out the bottom of the range, Okay. So there's no reason to get that excited. Yeah, honor your stops on your individual positions, but don't get too excited just because the market is towards the bottom of the range. As I preach quite often, towards the bottom of the range, okay, here and here, it's going to look a little ominous. It's going to look like the end of the world, okay? But just sit tight, I know, ha uh, and let things unfold. Yes, honor your stops on positions just in case – the market begins to roll over, but don't make any drastic decisions, okay? I guarantee you, you look at my emails here, here, and then as I wrote about ad nauseum on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, how everybody got so bearish a couple days ago, just a few days ago. Then look what happens. Bam, big up day. Bam, big up day. Yesterday, a bit of a pause day. It always amazes me, but I've seen it so many times it really shouldn't, that a market will go straight up for a day or two and then just kind of run out of steam, like, oh, that's it, and then, bam, next day turn around and go right back up. So now we're back towards the top of the range. Hey, Dave, is that the all clear? No, not yet, okay? Well, when will it be the all clear? I don't know. If we get outside of this range and stay outside this range, then – I'd be a little bit more excited, but things have vastly improved over the last few days, and to that I find very encouraging. We did have like a bow tie in here that tried to um, that tried to trigger, okay? 
So what happened? Kind of everything bow tied, and then we went right back up. Moving averages crossed back over. So we dodged the signal. Okay, so that's a good thing because a bow tie off all time highs, like I was saying earlier about those transitional patterns, can be very powerful. Oh, by the way, one thing to show you real quick. If you look at the highest close we've ever closed and you and you go forward to where we are now, we're right about a percent and a half and maybe a little bit of change away from all time highs in the S and P. In the NASDAQ, we're about 1.21% away from all-time highs, okay? So I still have some longs on that are left over from the last leg higher. So just because the market starts chopping around doesn't mean you want to rush out and exit all your longs. Also, if it's down towards the bottom of its range, you certainly don't want to bail out on everything just because things are looking a little ugly. Because what's going to happen? Well, two days later, there's going to be a news event, and that stock you were in is going to go up 50%, and I'm going to have me a nice dead money report the following week to write about. Okay. NASDAQ, not too far from all-time highs, but still stuck in a range. Okay, let's not get too excited just yet. Let's not start kissing each other just yet, as I often say. If anybody's seen Pulp Fiction, you'll know where I stole that line, and that's not exactly what he said. Um Harvey Keitel's character, the cleaner. Uh, NASDAQ is about a percent and change away from all-time highs, and so is the Rusty. I'm sorry, NASDAQ 40-year highs. Russell is going to be all-time highs. Now, Russell has been the poster child for range-bound trading and then wide and loose trading, too. It's going, it's going absolutely nowhere all year, okay? Wonder why you had a hard time catching trends last year. Look no further. It was down. It was up. 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 Oh, it looked like it was going to really break down here. Let's just get short out the wazoo. Nope, straight back up. Okay, that's kind of market it was last year. Uh, it rewarded the buy and hope crowd, the buy and hold crowd, but sooner or later they're going to get in a lot of trouble, and that's why. That's why active management. I don't want to brag about my stuff too much, but that's why active management works so damn well. That's how longer term, not one year, sometimes a little bit more than a year, but longer term, active management will work. Okay, there are parts of the market that where the market just kind of goes up, and uh, buy and hold looks like geniuses by holding through all these drawdowns and, and rollovers and all. But longer term it'll work, and that's why active management works so well because you get a year on occasion like 2007, 2008, where the market loses half of its value. And if you're buying and holding, you also lose half of your value. Okay, Doesn't always come back like it did since 2009. That I can assure you. But that's why if you look at the longer term performance of some things that I've done publicly, you'll see that they beaten like the S&P by a factor of four because you occasionally have a market like 2008. And that's where active management really kicks ass. And that's why you're here today, because you care and you want to learn and you don't want to just be a sheep following that S&P fund up and down and losing half of, half your retirement. Okay, You want to get in there and chip it out and you want to make some money longer term. You know you'd either get rich overnight but you could chip away at it, and longer term, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Can't guarantee anything, okay? I, I go to jail if I guarantee anything, right? But I can guarantee that longer term, you'll do a lot better than buying and hoping. All right, let me get off my horse. Um, some of these sectors in here, like the energies, obviously, are trying to bottom out a little bit. Let's not start kissing each other just yet again. I mean, we've seen this before. They kind of consolidated in here, then broke down again. But now it looks pretty good. They've got a little overhead resistance to deal with. Not too bad, but a little bit. But you can see they're kind of bottoming out. I wouldn't rush out and buy the energies just yet. I'd wait for them to maybe break out, maybe probe into this resistance a little bit, maybe set up as a bow tie or whatever. But they're certainly improving in here. Along those lines, gold and silver is kind of bottomed out in here. Um, last year, remember I kept saying we'd bottom out this year? I don't know if I'm right. I'm right a little bit so far, but it hasn't taken off. Once I make 100% in a couple gold stocks, then I can say I'm right. 
But I knew we'd bottom out this year just because it looks like we we're just bottoming forever. Okay. But if it had taken another year, so what? You know, I'm not going to make it a, a prediction until it's actually until I actually have a, a, a signal. And in this particular case, we got a bow tie, really nice little bow tie, coming off of all time lows in here. And those could usually be the most powerful signals, as I've been preaching quite a bit. Ditto for silver, looking pretty good in here. Now, what's kind of frustrating is chop, 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 chop. Will you just take off already? It's been frustrating. And when you're dealing with a highly efficient market, like a commodity, like a gold, like an oil, or something, things of that nature, then you have to you have to deal with that chop, and it's going to be fits and starts. And sometimes it'll knock you out, then go on the bottom out and take off again. Comes with the territory. Uh, banks. Well, before we get to banks, consumer durables peeping out in here. Some of these big cap areas are beginning to wake up and uh, break out. Not that there's anything I want to rush out and buy here, but certainly they are improving, and certainly this is a good sign for the big cap stocks. That these areas are breaking out. Uh, banks been really worried about those guys. Been really concerned. And last Friday, this is where I was a little nervous, truth be told, last Friday, okay? I was a little nervous that they would continue to break down and we'd have a route lower. But then what happened? We had a couple of good days in here, a little bit of a pause day, and then today we're peeping out to multi-month highs. I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet, but the good news is it doesn't look like so far that we're going to have a route lower. Oil, the commodity, as I just said, looking pretty good in here. Looks like it's bottoming out. I think this is a potential uh, buy. Set. Well, it is a buy setup. I think this uh, potential there. Retail, recently breaking out in here. Okay, so far, so good. Now, keep in mind, I'm always saying when things are kind of ugly, like on Friday or after Friday, on Monday, that all it takes is a few good days to make things look better. And that's what we had, and that's what we're having right now with retail breaking out, with durables breaking out, and some of these er other areas, defense, also beginning to break out in here okay to new highs but you take things one day at a time uh, drugs lagging a little bit today notwithstanding coming back nicely so that's a good thing and then biotech lagging a little bit coming back nicely today uh, not with well, lagging recently and then now today coming back a little bit moving averages turning down a little bit there so I like to see some new highs sooner rather than later to a less extent it's happening also in the drugs okay um, but the good news is the fact that they're coming back today suggests that so far they haven't topped just yet, okay? And sometimes, as I've been saying, especially in the service, sometimes you get a little bit of a rolling correction where a stronger area gets hit, some newer area begins to emerge, okay, or a weaker area begins to rally. It's like you get this rolling correction where a previously, I should say a previously stronger area becomes a source of funds, and that's very normal to have this rolling correction throughout the market. And that's why you don't get excited, because drugs have one or two or three bad days. Just wait for things to unfold, okay? Uh, semiconductors, I'm not going to go through too many of these, but a lot of these areas are range-bound, like the overmarket, but a lot of these areas have now made it towards the top of their range. So at least, at the least, they're hanging in there, okay? Now, take things one day at a time. A few days ago, again, these semis were probing the bottom of their range before they reversed. So, again, take it one day at a time. As long as the market is mostly in the range, wait for them. I did have Morningstar indices on my package. I look at another bank index, and it's breakdown. I find it weird. Um, well, sometimes I like to look at a couple other things, too. Like, well, look at your ETFs. Um, like the XLF was breaking down a few days ago, and then so far it's come back up. This is something I've been really concerned about, especially since you had the bow tie off of, uh, oops, all-time highs on that one, okay? So, yeah, if you don't have the morning stars, you could look at some other ones, okay? Am I putting this session on YouTube? I think I will. I think I will. As long as you all appreciate them, like I said last week, okay? I think I will. Um. Only other thing I want to point out, restaurants, especially the individual issue, kind of break it out to new highs. That's good to see. Uh, that's a consumer, what do you call that, discretionary area. XLF, is that? No, what is it? The XLY? XLY. 
Oh yeah, XLY. Okay, this is the consumer XLY is a spider's discretionary. You can see it's breaking out the new highs in here. So I guess people are taking some of that oil money uh, that they're saving, and they're running down and buying some food with it, which is cool. Yes, we do. All right, Nate appreciates it, so it's going up. Thank you, Nate. Um, cool. And if you are watching this on YouTube, I'll tell you what, I appreciate it. Just like it on YouTube, if you don't mind. I appreciate that. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and open it up for individual stocks. Do you prefer spiders for watching the ETFs? Um, well, there's certain ETFs I look at here and there. A lot of the ETFs, if they're liquid enough, they find their way into my, my daily analysis anyway. For instance, the IBB, I look at that quite often. Every day I look at the IWM. Um, I don't look at every single little little ETF out there because they're kind of thin, and I'm also more interested in finding a more efficient type of market than I am trading to trade an ETF. But every now and then, I think something like USO uh, could certainly make an inefficient type of move. It might be worth uh, trading. Okay, long for WLL for Mr. Gene. Okay. Uh, yeah, that looks uh, okay. Let's take a look at a few things here, though. Um, you got a little overhead resistance, but you know what? If it makes it to 50 bucks a share, I think you could live with that. It's got a little gap down in here. That's a little concerning. Um, you don't really have – well, it would have triggered this morning, okay? You have a, a bit of a reversal gap strategy, so it's already triggered on that. So if you're long, stay long, and uh, that looks pretty good. I can't argue with that. Twitter for Gary, TWTR, TWTR, okay. Um, this is too kind of wide and loose, and you got this big gap to deal with here, which is going to become a little bit of resistance. So that's going to be pretty hard for me to get excited about Twitter. But, yeah, I hear you. It's kind of bottoming out in here, a little wide and loose, though. Um, it would have to really rally significantly. It's a very thick stock, okay. So I think I would pass on that. It, it was pretty interesting back here when it finally broke out as an IPO. For those of you who have the IPO course, go back and watch it. And um, you know that I talk a lot about the IPO breakouts and, and significant of that, significance of that. But I think you could probably do better for now. ZIOP, Rondre. Um, well, it had this huge gap here. And so far, it's just kind of chopped around. So I think I would leave that one alone. If you're long, stay long. That's fine. I think I have this one in a momentum list somewhere. You spell hit Control M. It doesn't do that anymore. Oh, there it is. Um, let's see if I got it in some of my list. Landry 100. If I can find it, I need to clean up all these watch lists. Yeah, there it is, right there. See, it's in Landry 100. But I'd leave it. I mean, it's a momentum list that I'm tracking it. That doesn't mean I necessarily bought it, though. VG for John. Yeah, it looks pretty good. It's already uh, it's already triggered in kind of a pullback in here. So it would have to continue to rally. Uh, my only problem is I don't like stocks that make these, that are going back up to their prior highs because you end up with, sometimes you end up with like a double top situation. So I prefer something that would have clear air. John's been waiting patiently for a cake. First, I was afraid. I was petrified. And then a cake remake. Uh, I think I would pass just because it's kind of stalled a little bit. Eh, it's okay. It's tough. It's a tough call. Um, it looks like it's stalling out a little bit in this rally. I mean, a few days ago, it looked a lot better than it does now. I'll give you an okay on that. Um Maybe give it a little wiggle room if you go to enter. I mean, it's okay. It, it just doesn't jump out of me. Um, I really can't say exactly why. I guess I guess it's a little lower in volatility. It's only got an HP of 18. Maybe that's that's what uh, there's something that I don't like about it. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe the fact that it's kind of just kind of creeping out of its pullback and not taking off. Okay, which some of our positions do once we get in. So there's nothing wrong with it if you're already in. But if you're not in, the fact that it's really didn't follow through. Either wait for some additional follow through to entry or see if you can find something a little bit more volatile. Let John have his cake. <laughs> can you eat it too? Art says F C A U. Fuck you. 
How do you say that? Faku? Faku. Uh, this was a breakout way back here. I think we got it in here. Uh, maybe if it clears its prior highs a little bit more in here and a pullback, it might be worthwhile. But it is up at clear air. That's all. That's always a good thing. NVLV for Mr. Gary. NVLV. NVLV. Oops. NVLV. It's not coming up. NVLY. Did I see it wrong? Nope. NLVY. All right, give me the symbol again. I'm. It's not coming up. In the meantime, let's go to STZ for Fred. STZ, STZ. Um, well, it's trending, okay? HV is a little low. It's a food. It's kind of hard to get excited about a food, but it is trending. So if it continues to break out, maybe on a pullback. My only concern is if you're dealing with something like a like a food like this, that's, they're not splitting the atom, okay? And they've already gone up 500% over the last several years. So one has to wonder, are they priced for perfection, meaning that if they have a little bit of a hiccup or a little bit of a miss earnings or something, what's going to happen? I'd almost rather try to ferret out something that's a little bit more smaller cap, maybe a little bit more developing, a little bit more emerging or something, especially if you're dealing with a lower volatility market like the foods. But as a trend follower, I can't argue with you that it is trending, so maybe on the next pullback it might be worthwhile. Phil says to ignore that one. Okay, we will. HME for John. HME. Let's get somebody new after the next one. Sean, you're next. Um, yeah, it's already triggered, though. Now, again, this is a, this is a REIT, okay, lower in volatility. Um, like I said earlier in the show, there's too many to go through. I wonder if I could figure it out. Um, just because it's lower in volatility doesn't mean something bad couldn't happen. So I'd probably pass just based on that alone. Uh, let's see if there's something in here that's uh, it's 200. I want to see if I could find an example of something bad happening in a lower volatility stock. It might not let me do it. Well, just trust me on that. Um, there was a rally. There you go. Okay. Now look at this. You're trading a REIT, thinking that oh, it's not that volatile, and then bam, it gets haircut overnight. There's a couple of more of these in here too. So I passed based on that. Go in and watch that YouTube on efficiency. If it's not out there, let me know. I'll find it. And I'll get it uploaded. PG. Oh, come on. I'm not gonna like PG. Probably. Yeah, PG. Well, let me take that back. No, it looks okay. It's got too much too much support under the market. Yeah, it's set up as a pullback, and it looks okay. Uh, it's kind of like a go-go nomo type of situation. That's kind of the precursor for a go-go nomo, like that STZ earlier. You have a, a company that's not splitting the atom. They're not doing something that's like going to be earth-shattering or groundbreaking, right? They're just doing something that's not quite that exciting. So it's possible that they could be priced for perfection. So here's an example of kind of a go-go nomo situation, Procter & Gamble. But you've got a lot of support below the market, so I don't see any reason why you'd want to short that because it's just going to get back in this range and kind of meander around. So I'd leave it alone. Loco? Loco? That's what is what's the, what's the Lars uh, Hermanis, <laughs> the chicken place? Now, um, you've got a tremendous amount of um, overhead supply in here, uh, 26 to 30. I guess that would be an okay problem to have, but it's just too much overhead supply. You want to buy something with clear air. I mean, notice how this thing just took off as an IPO and went straight up 100% in just a few days. Um, that's something you want with clear air as opposed to um, trouble. What is it, Brothers Hermanis? How do you, how do you, okay, Andre's got his symbol straight. NLST. NLST. There you go. Um, very speculative. HV106. Okay, that's the first thing I see. Plus, it's wide and loose. It's kind of all over the place. Uh, I think I would pass. I think it's two. It's a penny stock. It's only a buck a share, buck fifty, and it's only 500,000 shares based on the price and the volatility of the stock. Uh, price and volume, I should say. It's it's a very low cap stock, so it's just kind of all over the place. I'd leave it alone. 
I mean, if you really did like those lower cap price issues, do a scan on lower price with decent volume. There's a few of them out there. I'm not going to point them out. Um, Shaq is ultimately a go-go no -mo. Yeah, but it's doing well now, so so what? Um, but it's not a go-go no -mo until it rallies up. This is still a new issue, so there's nothing to do here yet. And if you watch, go in and watch the... Go ahead and watch the teaser on the new issues right here on YouTube. Look look down here on your screen, and you should be able to find, or go to my video manager and look for the IPO teaser webinar. And I gave a lot of good information out in that webinar. And one of the things I pointed out is a lot of times IPOs just sort of die from the start. And so far, that's what this one has done is just die from the start. So you would have avoided a bad trade by not taking this IPO. And, you know, that's something that's hard to quantify is avoiding bad trades. But I work just as hard to teach you how to avoid tra bad trades as I do picking good trades. And, and you can't, you know, nobody call, nobody ever calls me up and, or emails me and say, Dave, you've helped me avoid some bad trades. And I save thousands and thousands of dollars for that, I thank you. Nobody ever does that. But trust me, you got something like an IPO like this that's just going down. Stay out of its way. How long the F E Y E suggested today? What do you think? Oh, I'm long. Okay, and that is Wilford. Uh, F E Y E. Um, well, I have no setup here. Okay, but I tell you what I like about this stock. I like the fact that it's made the mother of all low-level bases. Okay. Uh, I don't think you did the right thing by getting long already on this one. Um. I think you need to wait for it to break out of this base. But, yeah, that should definitely, definitely go on your watch list as a stock, what I call a Phoenix stock, okay? It was up at 90-something bucks a share, and now it's at 30-something bucks, okay? So what happens is these stocks get their act together, and then they begin to rise from the ashes. So, yeah, if it breaks out of that range and the first pullback might be, might work. Andre says, what's your view on point and figure charting? I uh, I tried point and figure charting once, and I found myself pointing to the chart and trying to figure out how I lost money. Uh, no, that's just a joke. Point and figure is is, uh, is plausible. Um, it's kind of like Darvis's box where you wait for it to move from one box to the next. The good thing about point and figure is that it, it does help you to identify support resistance. I prefer using bar charts. I'm not going to say that that you shouldn't use point and figure. I just happen to personal preference. Uh, point and figure, we just have this as one big fat sideways base, okay? Uh, it also be compressed a little bit. I prefer to just see the actual time frame, but it does kind of take the time out of the equation, which I guess if you're um, inclined to cash out as soon as something going sideways is probably a good thing. SLCA long for Howard. Uh, it's bottoming. I wouldn't rush out and buy just yet, though. Um, it's got some overhead supply in it. I mean, you know, if you're looking for some sort of bottom play, then look at those gold stocks. Look at those silver stocks that have already made the bottom, and, and some of them, not many of them, but some of them don't have the overhead supply. So it's got too much overhead supply. I hear you, though. It is bottoming, but I'd wait. FCG could become a USO setup, natural gas bounce. FCG. Um, yeah, I hear you, uh, Phil. It does have some overhead supply. Uh, good eye on that, though. I see what you're saying. It's kind of bottoming out. Let's take a look at the bow tie in here. It's trying to come together on the bow tie, but it's going to hit a little bit of resistance here around uh, 1415. But let's let's keep an eye on it. Let's see how it sets up. So, yeah, that's worth putting on your radar. NDIV for James. NDIV. Oops. NDIV. It's not coming up. Is it just VIV? Uh, a little too wide and loose in here. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, it's a little too wide and loose. I hear you. Uh, I see where it kind of bottomed out. But longer term, it looks like electrocardiogram, so I don't see any reason why you want to trade that. ELY, did we talk about that one? 
Uh, again, this one's just, this is another electrocardiogram. It's too wide and loose. I mean, yeah, it's breaking out to new highs, but in general, it's all over the place. Phil said, just notice that the mid cap 400 at new all time highs. Well, let's take a look at that. Yeah, um, wide and kind of looks like the Russell, though. But yeah, wide and loose. I wouldn't get, let's, let's start kissing each other just yet. But yeah, I hear you. Certainly uh, interesting. I think I'm going to wait for a bow tie in USO. Yeah, John, that's fine. Uh, whatever you think. Um, keep in mind that a bow tie is a much safer pattern to trade. Okay? But like I said earlier, we get paid to put money in harm's way. Okay? So a pioneer first thrust. A first thrust is a big thrust off of lows followed by a pullback. A pioneer first thrust it's kind of like a medium thrust off of lows or a small thrust off of lows the first pullback, okay? So within the emerging trend patterns, the bow tie is the most safest, followed by the first thrust and then further, you know, I could probably a um, first thrust and then the gatekeeper, then probably like the pioneer first thrust is probably the most adventurous of them all. And, and that kind of interchanges with the gatekeeper because the gatekeeper – it's close to a top picking pattern without being a top picking pattern too. Okay. Um, but I hear you. The only problem with a bow tie is a bow tie is great when the bottom becomes a process. Okay. Gold stocks made beautiful bow ties in here. Not not perfect because they're choppy, but as a general statement, okay, we're long sand, S A N D made a nice bow tie in here. Made a nice cup and handle. You've got all this structure behind you. A bottom is fairly evident, okay, by the time you get a bow tie. And it works great when you have a process. But sometimes it's an event. Sometimes the bottoms start with a bang. Uh, I've got a couple of articles in Traders Magazine. If you're not, uh, it's free to sign up. So if you want to go in and look at those transitional emerging patterns there, uh, obviously you could always read layman's, and those transitional patterns are in there too. So that's the only problem with waiting for a bow tie. In trading, there's always a trade-off. The, 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 the more confirmation you wait, the chances of that market getting away without you are better and better. But, yeah, by all means, it's if you feel comfortable waiting for a bow tie, then do that. Uh, this one has, has – uh, who asked about this? Uh, Andre, too, this is a little too extreme. This thing went up 40%. Uh, in a couple days, uh, also had a big gap way back here. Not that I'm really worried about that gap, but it just trades in these big chunks in here, and it's got it's got this overhead supply to deal with. I would I would pass on that. It's just too crazy and all over the place. You want something that trades a little bit more uh, cleanly. CDXS for Sean. CDXS. CDXS. Uh, now, at first glance, that looks okay. Let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, thin, really thin, but I'll tell you, I'll give you a high five on that one because you got a nice little pullback. I, ideally, I wish the pullback would be a little bit deeper, but not too bad. Notice that you accelerated higher. Okay, so it is a little bit volatile. It is a little bit thin. It can trade a little wide and loose, but I hear you. Uh, certainly, if you're just looking at if you just look at it like this, uh, it does look pretty good, okay? WLL, that's going to be wider. Yeah, we talked about that. MCAU. MI, MiFi. Yeah, I got a Wi-Fi iron. You have Wi-Fi? I got a Wi-Fi iron. <laughs> I need some waffles. Um, hmm. It's a tiny bit on the thin side, not too thin, though. But, see, it's already rallied up. It's already pulled back and then rallied up to its prior little pullback. So now what it's going to have to do, it's going to have to break out decisively and then look to play the next pullback along the way. But it's not bad. I think I've got that on momentum list, okay? XBI, BB, both pullbacks from 50 bots. Juno bounced up prior day after three days down. Car, T-stock, like kite, hot industry, new industry. Okay, let's see. Uh, XBI. I'm not sure. You make it a. Howard, are you telling me about your trading or are you asking a question? I'm not. You kind of lost me. PLNR. 
Uh, no, this is rolled over. This looks questionable. Are you thinking about shorting that? Um, yeah, it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Um, but the only problem is I don't like stocks that have these big old gaps up. Uh, they just get, get a little squirrely. But I hear you. I think it's in trouble. Uh, if it didn't have this huge gap higher, I would say definitely it might be worth a shot. Because here's the thing. You've got a tremendous amount of overhead supply. You broke it down from it. You're retracing back up to it. If it triggers, it could be a tremendous amount of trouble. But it's so overall the place to be careful. Bought Juno. Is that what you're telling me? Juno? Okay. Juno. Why would you buy Juno? It's going the wrong way. I mean, there is one pattern that I could see, but it wouldn't have triggered yet any IPOs. No. See, this is where you don't have the IPO course. All right. Let me just soft sell this thing. Let me hard sell it. Okay, and what did I preach about? Well, just watch. You don't even have to get the course for this one. Just go in and watch the teaser webinar, okay? So there's no need to buy this stock because sometimes you get what I call the fly pattern when they go straight up and then they go straight back down, okay? So, yeah, I don't, I don't see it. But to each its own. It's not my way or the highway, okay? Well, look, we're a little bit over an hour and a half. Let's go ahead and wrap things up. I have a blast doing these. Thanks for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Um, I just have a blast. Again, I learn a lot in the process, too. Thanks for, uh, again, showing up. Uh, any questions that are unanswered, daviddavelander.com, and I will get to them either personally. I will do my best to get to them personally. Or worst case, we'll cover it in next week's uh, seminar, so webinar. So I hope to see you then. Uh, oh, prego, prego, Marco. Uh, appreciate it. Okay. See you guys next week. Thank you so much.